So, um, hello everyone. I'm really happy to be here virtually uh, to talk a little bit about AI, uh, but not as in uh, artificial intelligence, but as in assistive intelligence uh, with the context of digital social innovation. So, uh, as you've heard, I'm Taiwan's digital minister and we deployed assistive intelligence to counter uh, the pandemic with no lockdown and also counter the infodemic um, with no takedown. And I would like to share uh, some stories, anecdotes about how that's done and maybe some ramifications on how to take the open source, open innovation communities lessons and apply it to politics, uh, to governance. And so, just to uh, be, be clear, uh, when I talk about AI in this talk, it is not about uh, something that passes the Turing test. It's not about something that's autonomous, that can pass as a, a person uh, or surpass a person, because that would imply uh, centralizing decision authority. And my work as a minister working with the people, not for the people, um, is focused on assistive intelligence. Um, I usually explain the idea of assistive intelligence uh, with my, my eyeglass, this one, which is a assistive technology. It helps me to see better, but it doesn't replace me. Uh, and when it's broken, I get to fix it myself or take it to the repair person down the street. Uh, I, I don't have to you know, pay for hundreds of thousands of dollars of license fees uh, just to reverse engineer how the glass is done. When it breaks, I keep those pieces. And that's the open innovation, that's the open technology that enabled assistive intelligence. So in the context of counter pandemic and pandemic, I usually analyze it in three pillars and that's fast fair and fun, and how the assistive intelligence can help to build a collective and connective intelligence. So first, um, this is the PTT, uh, the bulletin board system, the leading one in Taiwan. For the past 25 years, it has no shareholders, no advertisers. It's squarely in the social sector, an open source uh, forum. Actually, before the term open source catches up in Taiwan, it's free as in freedom, uh, licensed in GPL v3. You can find it on GitHub, and the governance is also open. So on PTT, it's the only place uh, at the end of 2019 when Dr. Li Wenliang's message <clears throat> spread from Wuhan to Taiwan that there were, and I quote, there were seven uh, SARS cases in the Huanan seafood market. Well, I'm sure that other social medias around the world also received some sort of message like this, but only on PTT because people are not distracted by the anti-social corner, the you know polarizing uh, hate field, the revenge field corner of social media. People acted pro-socially and triaged this message so that within 24 hours, we end up um, not only declaring the message as legit, but actually adopting it in the Central Epidemic Command Center so that we start flight uh, passengers, uh, health inspections and monitors uh, immediately on the first day of 2020. So Dr. Li Wenliang and the pro-social social media, the digital public infrastructure, that's PTT, literally saved the Taiwanese people. And so, um, of course, it's not just for people who can access a bulletin board system online. Uh, there are people who are uh, seniors or too young to use a personal computer. So they're, of course, not part of the PTT. But inclusion is very important. So once we set up the CECC, we uh, made it very clear that the collective intelligence actually functions through this toll-free number, or 1922. Anyone can call the 1922 from a landline or a mobile phone, toll-free, uh, and instead of a voicemail or something, always somebody with a lot of empathy. They could uh, come from a call center or a charity group like Ciji um, in Taiwan that uh, listens to them with empathy. And whenever anyone points out anything like Dr. Li Wenliang's message, anything that's broken in our current counter-epidemic efforts, the very next day on the next 2 p.m., the daily press conference will amplify their ideas into social innovation that's again adopted on a countrywide level. So, for example, um, as you can see, this was in uh, last year, last April 13th. Uh, the day before, uh, a young boy called 1922 saying, uh, hey, you're rationing out medical masks, which is great. Uh, but I'm a boy and all I got was pink ones, which is not great. All the boys in my class, he said, had navy blue medical mask, 
to wear to school. Uh, and I'm a boy, he says, I don't want to wear pink to school. Uh, do something about it. So it got escalated again within 24 hours. And on the very next day, next 2 p.m., all the medical officers in the press conference wore pink. Uh, and uh, Minister Chen Shizhong, uh, our central commander uh, of the Central Academic Command Center, uh, said that Pink Panther was his childhood hero. Um, and so the boy became the most hit boy overnight because only he has the color that the heroes wear and the hero's hero, I guess, wear. Um, and uh, fashion brands joined. Uh, and for a while, the pink mask became the most fashionable um, mask in existence until the rainbow mask took over during the pride. Uh, but what I'm trying to get at is that this is amplifying uh, someone who's closest to the pain as well, but amplifying it through digital innovation so that people can brainstorm on something, again, pro-social, instead of condemning the bullies or something, uh, we transform uh, the gender mainstreaming idea that pink is a cool color uh, and empower people to wear masks, not just for pandemic prevention, but actually you know, to, to show off, essentially to express themselves. Now, the fair pillar um, pertains to data collaboratives people who dedicate their processing power uh, to process data like a distributed ledger to ensure a fair distribution, first of masks. So last April, as I mentioned, uh, we instituted mask rationing and we understood very early on that we need to get three quarters of population uh, access to medical masks and wearing them. So. Uh, we distributed them in more than 6,000 pharmacies. But immediately there's a problem because people could queue in line in a pharmacy only to find it out of stock for the day and then shift to another pharmacy only to discover that it also runs empty. So uh, there were panic buying and conspiracy theories and so on. So we did not develop any single app. Instead, we published as open data uh, as part of Creative Commons attribution license uh, every 30 seconds on the real-time inventory of how many masks there were in each pharmacy. And with this real-time open API, many people in our civic technologies community began to develop these interactive maps. So for example, this was one of the early ones from the GovZero community, uh, which looks at a digital service in Taiwan, always something that GOV.TW and change the O to a zero to fork the government uh, to make something that's more interactive and more fun, more fair. Uh, and then you can actually queue in line in this particular pharmacy. This says it has 58 adult masks in stock, and this says it has 196 uh, children's masks in stock. And as you queue in line, as the person queuing before you uh, purchase a mask using their national health card, every 30 seconds, this number updates in real time. And once it uh, depletes, it turns gray. When it's low, uh, it turns red. When it's not so low, but still lowish, it turns yellow. So before people go out to buy some masks, they can already navigate to the pharmacy that still have plenty in stock, put an end to the rush buys and panic buying. And if people can't use an interactive map, again, on the spirit of inclusion uh, and alignment, uh, we bring the technologies to where people are. In Taiwan, uh, a um, instant messenger called Line is very popular. So immediately the chatbots online began to display the navigation cues. Even for people with seeing difficulties, voice assistants were developed, again, on a ledger of more than 100 different tools, all keeping the same tab of the inventories. So, and this also uh, made sure that when data bias is detected, it gets reported again on 1922 uh, very quickly. So there were even a parliamentary interpolation from MP Gao Hong An and Gao uh, from a, a opposition party, backed by a community called the Open Street Map, uh, because she worked with the Open Street Map people to analyze the overlay of population centers and the real time availability of mosques. Initially, we were quite happy because we see that the population centers overlay almost perfectly with the mask distribution via pharmacies. But MP Gao, with the OpenStream community, discovered it's actually not fair because not everyone own a helicopter. So although the kind of physical distance between each person on an average pharmacy's mask is the same, 
in the urban area that may translate to just 10 minutes of a bus ride, but on the rural areas, maybe three hours, you don't know, right? So the physical distance doesn't mean much uh, if the time, the opportunity cost is actually different. So uh, when analyzing this open API, the Open Street Map community worked with MPGAO to interpolate uh, Minister Chen Shizhong, uh, and MPGAO just explained this theory uh, and the uh, MP um, suggestion was immediately accepted by the minister. The minister Chen said, instead of defending anything, uh, he simply said, legislator teach us. So this enabled interpolation and demonstration to be not just protest, but essentially a, a pull request, right? So we adopted this renewed um, distribution method that is more fair to the time uh, that people takes uh, immediately in 24 hours. And we also enabled the pre-registration at the convenience stores and so on, and putting an end to the inequality and uh, the bias that's shown by the data. So again, data bias is bound to happen, but a fast iteration cycle ensures fairness. Now, um, this May, uh, when Taiwan faced our real only wave uh, so far, because last year uh, it's 10 months or so with essentially no local confirmed case, uh, and now it's been again a few months with no local confirmed case, but this May there was uh, a time when there was a real first wave in Taiwan. So we discovered that the contact tracing, which used to take more than 24 hours to build a history of contacts of person uh, infected, need to be shortened to less than 24 minutes. But again, just like the mask rationing map, we did not design any app. Rather, we just asked the people on Gov0, is there a design that can preserve the privacy of people while making sure that it's faster than signing your name and contact number on a paper. And a few people from the GovZero came up with brilliant design that's based on SMS that doesn't need uh, anyone to download any app. It works like this. On your phone's lock screen, uh, you can swipe left, I believe, uh, to pop up a camera. And if you point the built-in camera to a QR code that has the SMS2 protocol, it immediately pops up the SMS composition window and just click send. So that's like two seconds. So uh, there's a few things here, right? The 1922 number that the SMS sends to is already trusted. That was the toll-free number. So the SMS was also toll-free. The 15 digits you see here is entirely random and only the venue owner knows uh, the correspondence. And this SMS is not transmitted to the uh, government. It's stored like a post-it note on the telecom carrier. And in Taiwan, all the five telecom carriers um, agreed to store this for 28 days. And with a caveat that this says for epidemic control use only. So it must not, for example, be used for criminal investigation for any other like advertisement or whatever. The purpose is very clear. And only when somebody gets infected, do the contact tracer piece together the puzzles from the five telecom carriers, as well as the venue to 15 digit code mapping. <clears throat> so this, if you're in cryptography, uh, this is similar to the idea of a multi-party computation without the um, consent of the federated data storage. Individually, each piece of data does not compromise privacy at all. And we also have a reverse lookup system at SMS.1922, the GOV, the TW. So anyone with their phone can look up um, in the past 28 days, which municipalities, which contact tracer with which number have accessed which day of their SMS check-in. So it's reverse accountability, mutual accountability to make sure that it's aligned to the original contact tracing purpose. And so um, the lesson I guess here is that it must be fast uh, and fair, but also fun. It's actually a lot of fun to use this system because really there's no need to download an app. Uh, even for people with flip phones, uh, with no camera or QR code scanner, they can manually text the 15 digits to 1922 to complete a check-in. And of course, we didn't say you have to use this. You can still use pen and paper, but the pen and paper is now less crowded because most people now prefer to check in via the scanning of SMS because they understand uh, this uh, exposed them to even less privacy um, risks as compared to pen and paper because the pen and paper, you know, may be looked uh, by the person queuing after them. 
And uh, did I mention fun? Uh, because when each um, idea of counter pandemic or counter infodemic has a higher basic transmission rate than the conspiracy theories, than the disinformation, than the infodemic, uh, we make sure that people understand the clarification and the science in a way that people will also want to share with other people. And this is called humor over rumor, making sure that humor spreads faster than rumor. Remember the Pink Panther, uh, the person who suggested Minister Chen, uh, who uh, want to you know adopt the Pink Musk to respond with Pink Panther, uh, is a dedicated participation officer in charge of engagement uh, in each ministry. So we have a team of people in charge of engaging the public, listening to their ideas, and it just so happens that the participation officer in the Ministry of uh, Health and Welfare lives with this dog, a very cute Shiba Inu. Uh, so immediately, you know, the, the Dodge memes. Um, and so whenever we detect a rumor, we push out the humor that is based on this cute dog, allowing free remixing. So for example, um, when people question the use of masks, you see this particular meme from this very cute dog that says, wear a mask to protect your own face against your own unwashed hand. So it links mask use to hand washing. You can immediately uh, try it yourself and it's just very cute. So uh, people remix this, translate to different languages, uh, started short clips on it and so on to make sure that the science again spreads faster than the pseudoscience, than the conspiracy theories. Uh, the cute dog, yeah, as Ken uh, was posting a very cute Shiba Inu, uh, reminds you to cover your mouth and nose when sneezing. And when you're indoor, please keep three cute dogs away from one another. When you're outdoor, please keep two uh, cute dogs away from one another. And so um, people get into this very pro-social mood whenever people see this very cute dogs. And this is not just in the Ministry of Health and Welfare where we use mimetic engineering um, to dispel. The, the rumor, uh, the Ministry of uh, Education published the uh, uh, official dictionary, again, under Creative Commons. Uh, the presidential office, along with the Ministry of Culture, published uh, uh, building models uh, in Creative Commons, allowing for this sort of remix. Uh, I ask uh, the photographers who want to take my portrait uh, to donate their um, photos into the Creative Commons. You can find it on my Flickr. Uh, and so it became kind of an endless stream of memes uh, just by people remixing. Uh, the um, cultural works. But uh, in addition to the communication, which of course uh, goes viral, um, this way of donating the how of policymaking, the, the why of policymaking, not just what of the policies into the public domain, to the creative commons, leads distinctly to the people giving much better suggestions because people can understand not just uh, the exact policies, but why we're making such policies. You're, you're looking at my office in the social innovation lab in the heart of Taipei. Anyone can visit me for 40 minutes at a time if they agree that our conversation will be published into the Creative Commons as either a transcript co-edited after 10 days of co-editing or published as a uh, Creative Commons attribution film uh, on YouTube. So uh, when any lobbyist visit me in this space, they only talk about things that are for the common good. Uh, they talk about sustainability, uh, better air and society for the next generations, but they never lobby for something that's only good for them and bad for the next generation, because they know that the transcript or video will be viewed by the next generation. It will look really bad if they want to sacrifice uh, the interests of our future generations. So again, radical transparency and the commons, uh, make sure that people's ideas are aligned to each other. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we've long used the AI as an assistive intelligence platform to make sure that we can form shared roles, again, in a radically transparent fashion. The first time that we used a, a real um, assistive intelligence pro-social conversation tool designed for governance was in 2015. So. Uh, this is Polis, uh, and now it's part of, part of our digital public infrastructure at polis.gov.tw. Uh, it's again free as in freedom, Afro uh, GPL 3. 
So this idea is that uh, back in 2015, when Uber X first came to Taiwan, people were having a lot of tensions. Uh, some people say it's gig economy. Some people say it's sharing economy. Some people say it can reduce traffic congestion. Some people say it's um, unfair to the taxi fleets. Um, and so there's a lot of tension and controversies uh, in the society. And we decide to ask people not exactly what they suggest, but what they feel. So we publish again under the open data, uh, the real time facts of how UberX is affecting the traffic. But in three weeks time, we use a AI tool, uh, as I mentioned, Polis, to ask how people feel about it. And there's no right or wrong about feelings around the same set of fact. You may feel happy and they may feel angry, it's all okay. But then after three weeks, always some ideas emerge that take care of the most people's feelings. What we in the internet covenants call rough consensus or good enough consensus always emerge. And then we, we hum virtually uh, and uh, produce running code in this sense, legal code out of this rough consensus. So the uh, experience is like this. Uh, anyone logging in has this avatar here. You can see a fellow citizen feeling about UberX. And they feel, for example, that passenger liability insurance is very important. Regardless of its legality, the person sitting in the passenger seat should be insured. Now, if you agree, you move uh, toward this person. If you disagree, you distance away from this person. But there's no room for troll to grow because there's no reply button. And the distance says as much about you as about that person. There's no like or dislike dynamic going on. Actually, uh, K-means clustering automatically groups people with similar sentiments and represents them as an area. And the most divisive ideas form the X and Y axis out of principal component analysis. And this means that this is entirely astroturfing proof. If you get 2,000 people coming in, joining, voting exactly the same, you may see an extra zero here in group C, for example. It's just one single dot here. It will not uh, make this group larger because this measure plurality, not head count. And it doesn't change the result because we hold ourselves to account only on the good enough consensus, the ideas and feeling that can resonate across all the different aisles. And after three weeks of consultation, we always end up with this shape. This shape, which may be the most important part of this slide, shows that the divisive ideological statements, like this is platform economy, or this is sharing economy, um, do dominates uh, only a few percent of people's time. People don't spend calories uh, on these divisive ideologies. Rather, people spend most of their time agreeing with most of their neighbors on most of the things, most of the time. And if you only watch the mainstream news or the more anti-social corner of social media, uh, people's reflection will probably be the reverse of this picture. But because people can see uh, before their own eyes that they coalesce into some shared formed, shared goals, for example, not undercutting existing meters, that whatever Uber enjoy, we need to empower the local temple and church and the local fleet to also enjoy. That, of course, insurance registration very important and so on. Uh, Uber and existing taxi fleets and their drivers all agree on this. So then we invited all the stakeholders on live stream deliberation and they hold themselves to account to this rough consensus, just like, you know, protocol making. Um, and just like a working group, we produce the kind of consultative um, ideas for our legislature, for our parliament to pass. So now in Taiwan, for quite a while now, for more than a year now, uh, Uber is a legal taxi fleet in Taiwan. The Q taxi pays local taxes and the temple and churches, of course, benefit from surge pricing and so on. So everybody wins because people agree on a set of values that unites those people's uh, ideas together. And the KPI, the key performance indicators are crowdsourced instead of in a traditional poll or a survey predetermined by the persons making the poll or the survey. So um, as a conclusion, I believe that uh, with these anecdotal stories, uh, you probably can see that when the innovations are social in nature, when we empower people closest to the pain, so that anyone with a toll-free number, with broadband as a human right, with a um, digital access to such tools, then those ideas that take care of people's feelings will amplify 
throughout the society. And that's how we get the economic, environmental, and social sectors working together instead of automating each other away. And so to conclude, I would like to share with you uh, my job description uh, when I was digital minister for the first time uh, in 2016. The cabinet office asked me, so we've never had a digital minister, what would you do? What's your job description? I'm like, oh, if you know the sustainable development goals, um, my work is just 1717. Effective partnership uh, through 1718, reliable data uh, on 176 uh, open innovation. And they're like, Minister, I don't think that people in Taiwan memorize all 169 sustainable goal targets. You have to talk in plain language. So I translated that, of sorts, uh, into a poem, a prayer, really, uh, which is my job description. It goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, well, let's always remember the plurality is here. All right, that's my talk. Looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you for listening. Oh my goodness. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. I'm like, yeah. oh my God, I'm so touched, especially the ending. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. my God. We've got a tons of questions running, yeah. running down there. And um, so... Um, I, think, so I think what... Uh, um, Audrey has mentioned about um, putting all this um, summary, totally summarizes what uh, we are as developers. It's not only about technology, but it's also for the humans. So we actually do have to think about the humanity in there. So um, there we have uh, quite a lot of questions coming up and uh, they are mostly uh, wow, a lot of them comes up uh, in a different way. Do you, the first one that they asked was, uh, do you find any pushback from your colleagues in opening up uh, government data to citizens? And uh, how did you navigate that? If so, that's from Cody. Yes. Um, the idea is to be safe and swift. Whenever we open up data, it must reduce risk for the public service and also make the public service more efficient to save time. You can't increase risk to save time or waste time to reduce risk. That never works. So in the mask rationing example, for example, if we publish the data every day instead of every 30 seconds, counterintuitively, that actually increased the risk because people cannot audit the data as they queue in line. If they feel that the data is wrong, it will put a lot of pressure on the public servants that look at the data before they publish. But if we publish every 30 seconds, obviously we didn't look at the data before we published. We have no way to censor the data. So when there is data bias, uh, then the, like the OpenStreetMap community, you can't blame the public servant for hiding the data. Instead, you can perhaps blame uh, the bias uh, in distribution, but then we'll simply say, mm -hmm. okay, what's a better idea? And then the person complaining becoming our co-creator. So by making sure your procurement contract that an open API must be made just like universal access, right? In Taiwan's uh, procurement around the world, I'm sure uh, many people do the same. Uh, if a vendor said, I make a website only for people with eyesight, but if you can't see well, you can't use this website, then of course they may be banned from getting government contract for being, you know, not considering uh, discriminating against people with seeing difficulties. And we say uh, the Linux Foundation Open API 3 spec is um, empowering the robots. So if you make a web service in Taiwan, if the procuring agency asks you to provide for each human usable input output, also an open API, you must not decline. You must not charge a lot for it. Otherwise, you may also be banned from procuring government contracts for discriminating against robots. Well, we don't quite say that, but that's the effect. So because of that, we get those every 30 seconds updated API for free when we make updated or new government digital services. 
Oh. Wow. That, 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 really that everything cool. comes out like that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... Mind-blowing. That, that is... There's a lot of data in there. Exactly. <laughs> okay, uh, Am, do you want to ask the other question? Yes. Um, I've got a question from um, one of the audience, and I also share that experience too. So the question is, in my experience working with governments, I find them very risk adverse and often only take a waterfall approach. And that that results not in the best solutions or not the best results. What methods are you using to overcome this problem? Yeah, definitely. I believe that the bedrock systems the system integrators working on maybe still on, on DB2, uh, which is better than DBase 3, I hope, uh, in the in the most underlying infrastructure part of the government. Of course, they take a waterfall approach because the requirement doesn't change until the next fiscal year. Mm -hmm. So when you have a requirement change cycle that's defined by the parliamentary approval rate of the budget, then of course you can't afford to take a waterfall approach because it, the spec literally doesn't that's change correct. for you. Yeah, uh, but when you're countering the pandemic or the infodemic, the requirement literally changes every hour or with every 1922 call. So how do we reconcile the two? The open API, I believe, is a key part in it. It allows the bedrock system to focus on the stability, whereas the visualization, interactive maps, chatbots, um, whatever, uh, voice assistance uh, can be uh, tried out by the open source community, by the startups, by the people with a very agile methodologies. But we didn't procure those. We call it reverse procurement. That is to say, uh, it's demand driven. The Musk map, interactive map actually was prototype in Gov0 even before we published the open API. They adopted a Ushahidi like approach uh, when people queuing in line and the people in the pharmacy voluntarily report the inventory. Of course, it doesn't really scale because it relies on people to behave altruistically, uh, but it means that it can innovate without any government input. And when it gains popularity, <clears throat> the press discovery loved it, and then it creates a pressure <clears throat> for the government to adapt the bedrock system to produce the kind of API that's demanded by the already very popular social sector civic technology. So we are like the vendors of the civic technologies. They make the spec and we implement the spec. The same for the SMS contact tracing system. It's not my idea. Uh, the SMS based contact tracing was prototyped using Twilio or something uh, on the Gov0 community. But uh, of course, I talked to 192 to immediately to absorb the cost. But because the spec was from the privacy minded civic technologist, people uh, enjoying higher legitimacy, frankly, than the government contractors. So when we implement the spec that is defined by the social sector, I call it the people public private partnership, where the people crowdsource the norm, the public sector amplify the norm, and the private sector, mm -hmm. well, implements the norm. It could be waterfall at this stage, because the norm part is very agile. Wow. Oh my God. It just paradigm shift for software engineering by now. Yes, <laughs> I do agree with that. <laughs> yeah, so leaves no space for 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 why. Yes. So that how how can we actually work to create the reality that uh, you yes. see from data that people are more in agreement that they they are divided. Yeah, I think it's entirely um, the space that defines the interactions. So imagine uh, that if we're all in a physical park uh, or in a town hall, in a university campus and so on, people behave very pro-socially uh, and have much more in agreement than they are divided. But if we move the same sort of people into a bar um, in a night uh, life district and nightclub with very loud music uh, and very intoxicating drinks, addictive drinks with private bouncers and you have to shout to get heard uh, and so on, then people behave very differently uh, and there's much more disagreement, uh, brawls and so on uh, on that sort of space. Now, I have nothing against the entertainment sector just to, uh, for the record, but it, it does show that on the digital equivalent of the town halls, like the police, 
that I shared where people uh, without a reply button have to think more deeply mm. about how they resonate with one another and visualize this uh, like in oh. <clears throat> PTT where there are upvotes and downvotes but there is no advertisers or shareholders so um, people uh, get uh, the reward of their working with a pro-social way in a collective intelligence uh, without getting reward on um, angering or upsetting each other. So again, people behave much more pro-socially. And so, which is why we held our equivalent of town hall meetings on those digital public infrastructure. And in 2016, uh, on the advanced uh, infrastructure bill, we actually classify these digital infrastructure as infrastructure worthy of the special budget money. Previously, it was only for things that are concrete, like made out of concrete. But after 2016, we invest on these non-concrete digital public squares because we understand without these spaces, people will be essentially forced to deliberate about politics on Facebook, which is the equivalent of holding a town hall in a nightclub. Uh, and we will not get a pro-social more in agreement because it was simply not a space designed for that. It's totally so true about wow. that, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's how um, people actually um, cause us like um, anger or, or they try to protest and all this. It's because there's no common place for them to actually express themselves too. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, is there another question that you're yes. posing? Yes, I, I, I have this question and it actually captures my mind um, because it's, it's actually what I'm working on. So the, the question is, what kind of general design traits do you have to keep in mind for serving the citizens effectively, like QR codes or uh, flip phone or things like that? Can you share yeah. some experience with us, please? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and this is really a great question. Uh, I think one of the most important thing here is to design with the people, not for the people. And so I often remind myself with a uh, poem by Leonard Cohen, uh, really part of the song, uh, and it goes like this. Uh, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering, because there's a crack, a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. So instead of something that's perfect, which closes off future possibilities, make something that's imperfect and then open up this crack mm -hmm. for people to contribute. And so, for example, uh, we very quickly discovered that uh, many people don't use uh, a QR code scanning uh, built in camera. They prefer to use the line app to uh, add friends to each other via QR code scanning. So people pressured line in their friend adding uh, QR code scanning function to recognize the 1922 SMS as a uh, friend, essentially, and mm -hmm. send that SMS. Uh, but that would not be possible if we mandate on one single app. Because QR code is well understood by everyone, it's an internationally open spec, and because we print the 15 digits uh, as a fallback. So people have the room to try different QR code scanners, to try different QR code printing services. Mm -hmm. There are people who uh, print the QR code with very cute cats explaining how contract tech tracing works and so on. So QR code generator and QR code scanner, they're all very easy to make. And on both sides, hundreds of different implementations appear, which increase, again, the virality uh, mm -hmm. of the QR code scanning idea. So on the first week, uh, we have more than 2 million venues uh, adopting mm -hmm. this place. And since May to now, there's more than a quarter billion uh, SMS sent this way every day is uh, tens of millions of SMS. And that's because people choose the uh, tool that is more appropriate to them instead of we think of things that fits perfectly for mm. people. So it's more yeah. human testing than machine testing. Exactly. That's right. Collaborative learning. Yes. Mm -hmm. Collaborative learning. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that term. I love that term. I mean, that's also basically about um, open source community too. It's it's all about collaboration and to transparencies to actually open up and not to be not to feel worried that uh, someone is stealing your knowledge, but mm -hmm. to yes. grow by sharing. Exactly. Yeah. That's inclusion. So, inclusion. Yes. 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 So there is another question that says uh, it's almost like an approach to force adoption and government support through public adoption. 
how realistic is this to be adopted by other governments? Hmm. Sure. My wow. advice to other governments uh, who want to try something like this is very simple, is to trust your citizens. Um, yes. And if to, to give no trust is to get no trust. So if you don't trust the citizens to come up with better mm -hmm. specs and norms and habits than you possibly could, if you don't open up the necessary why and how of policy making, the real-time open data mm. for them to come up with new ideas. If you hide it, uh, all of the uh, draft and proceedings before the final policy is announced, hide it behind the freedom of information request and process, then the people simply has nothing to work with and you don't get the kind of zero community. So trusting the citizens maximally means uh, to be humble. And also to say to the citizens, um, whatever you're seeing is the same thing as I see. So if you don't like the way our policy making works, well, go ahead and do something. But if you don't share the data in transit, if you don't publish open data as soon as it's collective, if you insist on red acting, like not trusting the mm -hmm. citizen enough uh, to, to hide the partial data, then the citizen's time will be wasted on getting the scoop, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Getting what actually is the data, and then you will miss the opportunity of co-creation. Yeah, I think uh, once once people actually find that what they said is not heard, they give up. So they will, yeah. they'll, the second or third time, they won't bother to actually um, provide any inputs after that. So mm -hmm. I think what what you've mentioned just now about like it's basically like no one gets left behind. Like mm -hmm. what you said about yeah. the little child with the pink mask is totally about um, even the smallest voice in a corner can be heard. And I think this is something that's very important for uh, for the community and for collaborative uh, learning too. So, uh, Arm, do you have another question? I saw that. Yes, have... um, this question is going to be a little bit more data oriented and um, it's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, how, do you pref how do you filter the noise or the false information among those data that the general public provides? Yeah, um, as I mentioned on the police platform or on the citizens petition platform and so on, um, of course, people can get their friends to vote exactly the same, but because we don't compare the headcounts of pro versus con, it's not a vote. Mm -hmm. um, so it uh, doesn't really change the plurality. Uh, what it takes is actually mm -hmm. to suggest things that convince people across the aisle. But of course, if someone creates, you know, 100,000 different accounts, still that will disrupt the conversation. <laughs> so we do uh, use a real contact system, again, a, SMS. So when you okay. register on the joint platform, uh, you have to uh, respond to a one-time SMS to ensure that you own a unique uh, phone. Uh, but that phone number is not revealed uh, to other participants. You can still choose a pseudonym. Uh, you can still interact uh, without revealing your real, real name. Uh, and this is just to prevent somebody from spamming and creating too many accounts. And in Taiwan, of course, if you want to get 5,000 SIM cards, uh, the anti-money laundering people will discover you very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and so we kind of rely on the underlying telecom layer uh, to, to prevent fraud. And people are associated uh, with their SMS, but not with their real name. And the SMS is not published. I see. Mm, yeah. Mm. <laughs> That's very interesting. Yeah. So um, there is actually another question um, to ask about um, some. What are the some successful examples that uh, Taiwan exports uh, those experiences to other countries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So uh, I, I think one of the most uh, successful examples uh, was the uh, map. Right, the, the mask rationing map. Not only uh, it was adopted almost verbatim in South Korea just one month after in March 2020, but also inspired uh, many similar mask efforts uh, in Japan and in many other jurisdictions. Uh, but because uh, we're in virtually uh, in Thailand, uh, I want to also share uh, another uh, thing that shared uh, that's uh, spread to Thailand, and it's about the counter uh, infodemic. So uh, in Taiwan, GovZero has an effort called CoFacts, 
uh, meaning collaborative fact checking, and it's a line bot. So anyone who see anything that looks like a disinformation on the uh, line platform can just forward that particular piece of information to the cofacts.org bot. Now this bot, uh, which I'm trying to, to show via a screen share, can you bring up the screen share? Yes. So yeah, uh, so it basically says, follow the line ads of Colfax and send any suspected hoax, scam, rumor, urban legend to verify its truth. Uh, and what it happens is that it will go to a Wikipedia-like community, uh, which uh, looks at the, this information that has the most number of uh, people reporting it. So it's just like what Spam House does to spam. And then the Spam House-like uh, approach enables people to focus their fact checking to the places uh, where people have a maximal uh, interest uh, on the uh, disinformation going viral. And it has spread to Thailand as well at blog.cofact.org. So like Cofax, but without an S, I just pasted it to the chat. You can see the same idea that uh, basically works in, in Thailand as well. And just like uh, other international fact-checking journalism network, the IFCN, Thailand also has professional journalists working with these volunteer people, many of them in middle school or high school, uh, together in tandem. So that, for example, in 2020, January, when our three presidential candidates were having their platforms and debating with one another, uh, the middle schoolers working with the COFAX community can type their uh, speech in real time into transcript, fact check the numbers and facts they used. And if a discrepancy is discovered, the Time Fact Check Center working with the public TV and so on, show those contributions in real time during the debate. And though it in, empowers the middle schoolers so that it goes beyond the idea of media literacy which is about how you receive information. This is media competence, meaning that whatever people uh, contributes to remix uh, into a fact-checking report, it has immediate social impact. So this is a idea of humor over rumor through collaborative fact-checking that has since spread uh, to Thailand. Wow. Wow. That's one of the best examples that I think um, other countries could actually adopt to it and uh, can yes. still, um, any country could actually use it too. So Arm, I see that you have another question um, regarding yes. the VR and AR. Yes, um, so this question is actually from me and also from one of my friends who is talking to me on Facebook. He's watching this, this <laughs> live as well. So yes, <laughs> and um, the question is, as virtual reality and augmented reality become integrated to social media, um, that would actually exacerbate social problems and mental illness to the citizen. What's your opinion and suggestions for the government to deal with this issue? Yeah, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, I draw a distinction between virtual reality and shared reality. reality. A shared reality is rooted in something that's real, a real crowd of people visiting a real place, except, of course, some people are not actually in the same time zone, not in the same space, but it's rooted in real human interactions. And so when I use shared reality tools, for example, I model myself into a 3D model. Uh, I used to talk to middle schoolers and some primary schoolers uh, in their schoolyard uh, modeled uh, within the virtual reality. And I lower my avatar to their height, to exactly uh, their height, and look at their schoolyard from mm -hmm. their perspective. Uh, and this <laughs> enables me to, to feel their environment. And they don't have to uh, look up to me quite literally, right? They can treat me as one <laughs> of their peers. And, and this, obviously, doesn't lead to mental health issues. This actually <laughs> solves some mental health problems of unequal power uh, by kids and adults and things like that. So I believe if, he, if people have the right and the ability to customize the acoustic model, the physics model, the interaction model with one another, 
then it become a pluriverse, right? A multiverse, not a major yes. verse. Uh, mm. And uh, people can then, um, just as we can design a space in the physical space to maximize pro-social behavior, we can mm. do the same on the digital realm as well. But that relies, of course, again, on free as in freedom software, on open source and open innovations. Uh, the reason why I can change my avatar and the acoustic model was because I was using an open source uh, suite of virtual and shared reality called high fidelity.io and there's more and more building blocks of these kind of augmented reality that has the same open source principles with a shared governance uh, that is open so i believe anything that you cannot set uh, a local instance with a full feature uh, is actually not multiverse it's not pluriverse it's just um trapping you uh into a, a yeah. meta first that's maybe dominated by meta yeah, I couldn't agree more because um, I was actually, I used to teach and uh, one of the most important principle is to look in the height and the view of a perspective person that you are looking at. Yes. So what you said was totally true. Like if you want a child to listen to what you're saying, squat down and kneel down at their height to see at their level, because that's how oh. they can actually see what they, they're seeing. Take a camera and look at their height where they're looking at and that's where you can actually see their perspective so audrey about the the ar and vr that you say putting on according to the height that's that's like yeah spot on spot on exactly. for that yeah so there's another question here say um how can grassroots versions of the systems you have talked about best operate within authoritarian top-down regimes Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Taiwan used to be an authoritarian regime. When I was born, Taiwan was still in martial law. So uh, we had no freedom of press or freedom of assembly, right? Uh, but, but at that time already, uh, people built legitimacy from the social sector by focusing on things that are, uh, frankly speaking, apolitical. Right. So based on, for example, protecting the environment, focusing on mm -hmm. protecting one another's health, on public health, dispelling rumors about uh, food and drug uh, misuses. If you microwave this, it will cause cancer or things like that. Right. So by focusing on things uh, with a more civil application, I believe mm -hmm. that we can get the same sort of legitimacy within the social sector without directly uh, challenging the, the authoritarian government. Uh, one case in point. Uh, was that um, the COFAX uh, initiative. As mm -hmm. I mentioned, in more authoritarian regimes, there's also um, instances of COFAX springing up. But what they do is that they work with the authorities to make sure that the authorities counter um, rumor efforts in food and drug administration and so on uh, gets more popular. And so it's, of course, it's a common good, uh, but that means that the consumer protection organization, the uh, co-ops and social entrepreneurs working uh, with these grassroots versions also enjoy a high legitimacy by the people. Uh, if you share my screen, uh, there is one uh, small example uh, when I say humor over rumor. So with the help of the COFAX like approach, uh, the authorities like Food and Drug Administration and so on can dispel a rumor as it goes viral in just 60 minutes. And so this is one of the example when Premier Su Zhen Chang, head of our cabinet, first become Premier, uh, he worked himself uh, in such a humor over rumor campaign. And this is something that I would suggest you uh, in a grassroots campaign to, to focus on. So there was a rumor at the time that said, you'll be fined one million NT dollars for perming your hair many times a week. Uh, and this culture <laughs> said, it's not true. Uh, and the premier uh, said, it's, it's not true. And I may be bald now, but I used to have hair. I used to look like this. So I will not punish people who look like my youth. And a small print that says, well, we've introduced this labeling requirement for hair products that takes effect on July 2022, but not punish the consumers. And then this part, which mm -hmm. I didn't translate, the premier as he looks now with a hair blower says, however, if you put on your hair many times a week, it will not damage your bank account, but it will damage your hair. Just look at me for what will happen to your hair, uh, because of course you now. <laughs> and, and I'm not sure that, that this is much more viral than the disinformation in the room. So if you focus on the two Shiba Inu uh, and the boss 
entrepreneur, uh, you can operate quite successfully with social legitimacy, even in more authoritarian societies. This, that's actually the best way for, for, for people to actually um, absorb information by humor, because everyone loves humor. Actually, Th Thailand is really, really, really good uh, with uh, humor um, media. I, yes. I think it's one of the best uh, in the world, but how they actually integrate humor into life. But I think uh, what, what, the, um, what you have shown as an example is a great one, because putting humor into yourself and show it putting it out to, to, to the others actually does not offend the others, but mm -hmm. you yourself give the permission and mm -hmm. uh, you, everyone mm -hmm. laugh and enjoy about it and the information got through everyone. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's right. actually Don't make fun of other people, make fun with other people, right? Yes. Yes. I mean, <laughs> We, we we know what we can make fun of ourselves and we give the authority yes. we sign ourselves that it's us so that's that's not a problem okay so um is there i think uh, i think you just uh, answer everything perfectly yeah and we're at and time. it was sorry so we're, we're probably at time right yeah on uh, yeah. time i i've mm -hmm. never seen anything that correct before <laughs> 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 is that, yes. is that a, um, someone who is like a collabor collaborative learning that actually um, yeah. timing there or somehow, I don't know, but it seems to work very well here. So um, is there anything else that uh, we need to uh, address um, arm for the, for this? I think we, I think, I think we are fine with it. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, thank you. Thank you, Audrey for uh, coming in. And uh, before we leave, we would like to um, thank everyone yeah. else to um, to this special closing uh, keynotes. Uh, we are really, really honored, Audrey, to have you yes. here to share um, your knowledge and experience with us. And I think uh, this totally, totally actually shows that um, if someone has empathy and, and everything, no one's is too high to reach. So even Audrey can actually come over and listen to and and um and you sh answer your questions that you ask and that is called the level of approachable uh, approachability that you can actually have for each person and the imp importance importance of us yes. developers to be able to do that and that's the key of uh, humanity and uh, human technology so um before we we close off i would like to um, thank everyone for coming and um PyCon Thailand is really, really happy to have uh, to host PyCon APAC this year. And um, we have to share and pass our um, the, the fire of Baton to someone else next year. And by chance, it wasn't uh, any intention, by chance uh, next year, uh, PyCon APAC will actually be held in Taiwan. Yes. <laughs> So can we actually bring up um, David, who is going to be uh, PyCon uh, Taiwan's uh, conference lead next year? Hi, George. Hi, hi um, hey, everyone. And thanks, PyCon Thailand, to bring us a really great PyCon Epic conference. Is that clear? Yes, <laughs> we can hear you clearly. Yes. Okay. And we know that it's really, really difficult for our communities to hold events and keep connection with our member in remote this year. And the pandemic has changed our how we were, learn and interact both personally and professionally. And I hope all of you are staying healthy, safe, and good during this time. And in the past year, PyCon Taiwan retrospected our role as the Python community platform in Taiwan. We have improving our agenda and events by introducing wonderful thoughts and experience from other Python conference in the world to Python Taiwan. We also enhance the exchange of experience between local to local and the local to international Python communities and kept adopting innovative plans. As a platform for the Python communities, Python, PyCon Taiwan invites all Python users, developers, and promoters to join our events. We are very excited to announce that we are going to host the PyCon APEC 2022, and we wanted to invite all of you to join our events. I really, really hope to see you in person next year. And until then, stay safe and be well. 
I'm David from PyCon Taiwan, the chairperson of the PyCon iPad Conference 2022. See you next year. Wow! Yay. Is that all? All all the all all the um, preparation that you have um reading and it's just so perfect. Exactly. Can you see mine? Mine is all scribbled. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is like it's, this. it's left <laughs> and it's right, and that's what I have here. <laughs> so thank you, Audrey, so much for um for for coming here and yeah, to we're so honored attend. to have you here. Yep, I mean um if it's if it's not now, then when that we actually ask you. So, right? <laughs> so um it's once again, again. Mm -hmm. sorry. So yeah, I I just want to say that um. I, I was really happy to have received this invitation and doubly happy that some of you may be visiting Taiwan. So when you're in Taiwan, be sure to drop by the Social Innovation Lab. I may be there and we may share some uh, cup of bubble tea uh, <laughs> in my office. <laughs> yeah, well, I love to do so. I love Taiwan. Yes. It's just uh, so open and diverse and um, it's not what you think it is. So if you have actually have the chance to go do step in and 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 enjoy Taiwan. I think it's one of the most beautiful um, countries. Yeah. So thank you, um, Audrey, and uh, we will actually have to thank um, and thank you, David. David. Yes. So thank you. The and because PyCon Taiwan has came has just come in and helped us so much. The the challenge of us this year to create PyCon APAC was really hard because online APAC that means you have several languages. You have um, people from around um, different regions. So the only way we actually create was to ask um, volunteers from different countries to create moderated chat rooms. And without the help of people like PyCon Taiwan to make sure that they had moderated the Chinese room and then PyCon Philippines in the Filipino room and uh, India for the uh, yeah. Hindi room and Japan and Korea Oh my God, this is just amazing. I, I mean, I couldn't have done it without everyone's help. And that's what um, Audrey has been saying to the one that you actually has been um, working on and still working on it. And I think uh, if every one of us actually work towards this uh, direction, then um, the growth will be there and it will be sustainable. So, um, not we should not um, waste uh, Audrey too much time because I think she will have a lot of things ahead to do. And uh, thank you, David. So we'll just leave with um, um to Boba Beer. Yeah. Yes. Boba Beer. Oh my God. BBB. BB. <laughs> I I would I would Triple prefer B. Boba Tea. No no no. Yeah. Boba Beer is something that I would like to Boba try. Oh, well, but probably I'll. I'll burp out the, the bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> so um, before we close, yes. um, everyone, there's still a, a few other talks coming up. And um, yeah. do not forget that uh, Isabella Morella, who, whom we actually invited to um, talk about keyboards yeah. for everyone who's interested in mechanical keyboards, will be answering the question live for you. Yeah. And again, yes. my paper here. Um, we love to actually really thank everyone. You can see in the general chat, look at all the yes. names there, like um, Yangun from uh, PyCon Korea, you have uh, Taiwan, like um, David, and uh, let me scroll, Ta Xiang Ho, and, and we have also PyCon Hong Kong, we have PyCon India, we have PyCon Japan, yes. Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Korea, thank you, thank you so much. The challenge this year to actually set up a PyCon online is again, like what I said, really hard and not easy to, yeah. to make it happen, but it did. Yes, and, um, and yes, we, we would like to thank our sponsors as well. Yes, without them, we cannot make it this far. So our first sponsor is the headline sponsor, which is Microsoft APAC. Oh my God, they're, they're just so nice with us. And our go sponsors are Intelligent Bytes and Odds. Um, they're so nice with us as well. And our patron, um, we have Abet, Good Skills, Gummy Bears, Recruitment Technology, um, Elastic, Sticky Mill, and 
Prodigy 9 and um, Notion. So all of them, we are so grateful for them for their help and support with us. Without them, we cannot make it this far. And our partners, yes, we never forget our partners. We have our partners from Python Software Foundation, Matt RID, um, Academy of Fine Foods, and Event Pop. Thank you once again, everyone, for um, attending uh, PyCon APAC. And um, see you next year in uh, PyCon APAC in, in Taiwan. Taiwan, yes. Yes. Okay. Yay. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>